our world could change due to several global events in the next few weeks. Here to tell us what to keep an eye on is Jim Rickards. He's a strategic intelligence editor and New York Times bestselling author, and his latest book is Money GPT. He joins us right now. So, Jim, let's start with the election. Early voting is underway in many states. So how do you see this shaping up? Well, uh, that's right. Early voting uh, is underway. Uh, the best estimates are that about two thirds of the voters will vote early, whether it's mail in, absentee, Dropbox, you know, lots of different uh, channels. Uh, and perhaps only a third of the American people will vote on Election Day, uh, which means the election could be half over right now and will probably be over to all intents and purposes before Election Day. We won't know the results. They won't open a lot of the ballots and count them, et cetera, until Election Day. But it's pretty much over. That's one reason you're seeing such um, intensity, really, in the in both the Trump and the Harris campaign. I would say Trump's probably uh, doing a better job in that in that regard. Um, and uh, the other thing that people are asking themselves is, you know, why the heck is Trump going to uh, California, and New York, he's been, uh, and Virginia, and other states where he's um, well, he certainly won't win California or New York. Virginia's a little bit closer, but why is he spending time there? The answer is um, they're really trying to help the House of Representatives. They're trying to keep some of these House seats. The Republicans took a bare majority in uh, 2022, um, but a lot of those seats were actually, in, they were in New York and California, about five in each state, and they want to hang on to those and expand that so they can keep the House of Representatives. That's really important in terms of what the Democrats are going to do to uh, disqualify Trump even if he wins the election on November 5th. So there's a lot of uh, things going on behind the curtain, but uh, you know, it's close to, uh, right now I would, my best estimate, my, I, I have my own proprietary models, but of course I look at others. I've got Trump as a, a winner in what's probably gonna be a tight, ra a tight race, but uh, the Democrats take the House, they'll be moving to uh, disqualify him on January 5th. Jim, let's, let's talk about that a little bit because uh, I mean, I think there's, personally, I think there's no way around volatility increasing Either way, uh, you know, as we go forward. So let's talk about that period between, um, you know, voting day and in inauguration day. Um, what, what do you think is going to happen during that time? Sure. And uh, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, a lot of Americans aren't familiar with it. And, you know, they there's no reason they should be. It's, it's pretty technical stuff. You have to delve into the Constitution, and the 12th Amendment and so forth. But uh, there are two critical dates, three altogether. Uh, ending on January 6, 2025. You know, we hear endlessly about January 6, 2021. Okay, we know what happened, but January 6, 2025 will be a big deal. So here's how it goes. So on election day, it's November 5th, you know, we get the results. We may not know until November 6th or November 7th. I mean, if they're fighting how to count ballots or qualifying absentee ballots, your signatures match, there's a lot of technicalities there. They could be fighting over that in places like Pennsylvania and um uh, Arizona and, and Georgia for several days. So maybe <laughs> November 7th is the day they kind of actually announce a, a, a winner. But um, it's not over. You know, as Yogi Berra said, it's not over till it's over. You've got two critical dates in December. One is when the uh, the electors actually vote for president in each state capital. You know, we think we're voting for Trump or Harris when we go to the polls. What we're doing, we're voting for a, a slate of pledged electors who will then support Trump or Harris. So indirectly, we're really uh, uh, really voting for those electors. So uh, I think it's around December 11th. And it could be off by a day or two. Those electors go into the state capitals and vote for president. Um, and then there's another, but the, you could have a fight right there. Are the electors qualified? Does, do the Democrats claim that uh, the Republican uh, electors were not properly elected because of you know, irregularities, uh, disqualifying illegal immigrants from the voting rolls. We see that going on in Virginia. So there could be a lot of fights right there. Then uh, about a week later, I believe it's December 17th, again, give or take a day, the state official, the governor or the secretary of state, as the case may be, certify those electors, those electoral votes, but they're actually people. I mean, they, they, we count them as votes. The numbers matter, but um, they're actually people. Um, and then certify that and send it to Washington. Then you come to January 6th, 2025, and that's when the Congress counts those votes and declares a final winner. Uh, and the Senate does the vice president and the House of Representatives does the president. Now, here's the thing. The Senate and House I just mentioned, 
It's the new Senate and House. It's not the existing Senate and House. It's whoever wins on November 5th. They get sworn in on January 3rd. Uh, this process I described, a final uh, declaring winner is January 6th. Well, on January 4th, and they've already announced this, Jamie Raskin, a uh, member of Congress from Maryland, a Democrat, is going to introduce a resolution to declare Trump an insurrectionist under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. This was a post-Civil War amendment designed to disqualify Confederate uh, officers uh, and politicians from holding federal office. That, that's what it says. But it doesn't say Confederate. That was the purpose. But here it is 100 and uh, uh, what, almost 100 years later. Um, that's that's still the law. So if you declare Trump an insurrectionist, you could disqualify him from holding federal office, which means his electors won't count. Now, you could have a situation where Trump has, I'll use round numbers, you know, 300 electoral votes and Kamala Harris has uh, 235 electoral votes. That's an electoral college landslide. But if you disqualify Trump on this insurrection clause, what happens next? Well, the Constitution, now we're in the 12th, not the 14th Amendment, um, and it says that this election is then thrown to the House of Representatives. But it goes on to say that the members of the House uh, can only vote for the one of the top three electoral vote-getters. Well, in the scenario I just outlined, there's only going to be one, which is Kamala Harris. Nobody, if you disqualify Trump, then nobody has 270, uh, but nobody has any more either. There's nobody else other than Kamala Harris who has any electoral votes. So at that point, you could be in a position where even the Republicans have to vote for Kamala Harris because under the um, 12th Amendment, she's the only one. I mean, there's they say top three. You could have a... You know, if anyone, you know, George Wallace won electoral votes in 1968, uh, but this isn't 1968. So she's the only one you can vote for. So the question is, would the Republicans be forced to vote for Kamala Harris because that's the only choice given to them by the 12th Amendment? Meanwhile, what's going on in the Senate? Well, the Senate should just, um, in this scenario, just declare J.D. Vance the vice president. So you could have a situation where you have Kamala Harris as president J.D. Vance as vice president, which is exactly what happened in 1800, by the way, between Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. They were different parties. They hated each other, but they were the president and the vice president uh, the way it worked. Now, here's here's the twist. Here's the thing to look for. Hopefully the Republicans are smart enough to figure this out. The 12th Amendment also says that the process I just described cannot take place if there's not a quorum. So all the Republicans have to do is go out on the mall and stand in the snow, and that would cause the House not to have a quorum, and you couldn't pick a president because there's no quorum. Then you say, well, then what happens? What happens next? Well, the 12th Amendment says in that situation, the vice president becomes the acting president. So you could actually have J.D. Vance as acting president on January 7, 2025. I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds far-fetched, but think about what we've been through recently. We've had two attempted assassinations, a coup d'etat on Joe Biden, a face plant debate uh, at the end of June between Biden and Trump. Um, everything that's happened so far, this doesn't seem a stretch, but it's all there in the 14th Amendment and the 12th Amendment. I, I'm so glad you just laid that out because it's something I think about a lot. And I think Everyone else needs to start thinking about it now. Yeah, absolutely. And OK, so that's the situation that's going on in the United States right now. Globally, there is a huge meeting. The BRICS start meeting tomorrow in Russia. So, Jim, I know you know all about this. Is, the, is this the next Bretton Woods? What should we be expecting from this meeting? Well, it might be the uh, the end of Bretton Woods. It's a great question. You know, I'm, I'm constantly surprised. I look at stories and I do a lot of research and in-depth uh, analysis and I say, this is the most important thing happening in the world today, and it's barely being reported. I'm glad you brought it up, but I, I can assure you this is not being reported on uh, any any uh, corporate media channels or mainstream news channels. So just for the benefit of the uh, viewers, uh, what are the BRICS? Well, it's an acronym. It stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Uh, not a new organization, by the way. They've been around since 2006. Uh, and they've been doing quite a lot of work in the meantime. Now, at their last meeting, they have an annual leader summit, they have about 100 meetings a year. They've got meetings on sports and women's rights and human rights, a lot, lot of other finance, a lot of other things going on. But this is what's called the Leaders Summit. 
Um, and they have a rotating presidency. So this year, guess who's the president of BRICS? Vladimir Putin. And it's taking place in Russia, in the Russian Federation, um, in the in a, a town, a city called uh, uh, Kazan. So it's in Kazan, the Russian Federation. Uh, Vladimir Putin's the host. He couldn't go last year because it was in South Africa. And there was some fear that he would be arrested because there is a warrant from the International Criminal Court. I think that was a miscarriage of justice, but the warrant's out there and he really couldn't take a chance on some NGO trying to arrest him in South Africa. Anyway, he's the host. He's in Russia. Um, Xi Jinping is there. Lula of Brazil. Uh, Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa. Um, all the, uh, as I said, the heads of state, uh, Prime Minister Modi of India, they're all there, plus others. They had new uh, members join last year, um, Egypt, uh, and, uh, and UAE and, uh, and Ethiopia and, and a couple others. So they've expanded the membership. Now, what, what are the BRICS doing in particular that should be of most concern to Americans, really to the international financial system? They have been creating an alternative payment mechanism so that they can, first of all, not use the dollar at all in all their bilateral trade. Uh, and secondly, that they can make uh, secure transfers, uh, message traffic, you know, I owe you money or you owe me money. How do we how do we communicate that? Can we do it in a secure way that the NSA and the CIA and the U.S. can't interdict that message traffic? That's what they've been working on. Um, and they've made a lot of progress. And that's going to be announced uh, tomorrow and the and the day after uh, in, in the next uh, in the next couple of days. Now, uh, is this the end of the dollar? Not immediately, not overnight. I mean, the dollar is still 60 percent of global reserves and uh, um, a you know, comparable amount, actually larger in terms of global payments. So the dollar doesn't go away overnight. But this is the beginning of a major alternative to the dollar. So the way it would work is that, you know, Russia, um, you know, ships energy to India and they get paid in rupees um, and China ships manufactured goods to Russia and they get paid in Ruples or yuan, etc. But well, there's a lot of a lot of money flying back and forth. But you have to keep a ledger, so they're using blockchain technology for the ledger. Now, this doesn't mean cryptocurrency. Don't run it. I mean, if you like Bitcoin, that's fine. But I'm not saying run out and buy Bitcoin. The blockchain technology has been around since the 1980s. It's not the same as uh, as how cryptocurrencies work. But they but it's very secure, uh, and they will be using blockchain to keep the ledger. Um, and there'll be all kinds of do tos and do from. So Russia will owe a certain amount of money to China or India will owe money to Brazil, et cetera, uh, to encourage all this trade. But here's the importance of it. No dollars. There are no dollars in this system, number one. And number two, they've created it from the ground up and it's completely secure, at least as secure as anything can get. So that, you know, we all know in 2022, the, right, the U.S. froze the assets of the Central Bank of Russia, which was, and we do that from time to time, but that certainly sent a chill in everyone's spine. Like, hey, do I really want to own U.S. Treasury securities if the U.S. can uh, freeze them every time I do something they don't like? But now it's worse than that. The U.S. is actually stealing $50 billion. The U.S. and Europe, uh, EU together are stealing $50 billion of the Russian assets to finance a loan to Ukraine to fight a war against Russia. So if you're Russia, you just went out of the system. I mean, whether they ever get their money back, the 300 billion remains to be seen. But the fact that it was not only frozen, but that they're stealing it and using it to finance the war in Ukraine uh, is enough to get not just Russia, but China or anyone else who, who cares about their reserves to get out of the dollar system. And Russia was kicked out of SWIFT. That's an international payment system. Okay, so we kicked Russia out of the system, stole their money, and said, we don't want you. So, But Russia has over $600 billion in reserves. Now, they did a very smart thing over the last 10 years. They actually bought gold, and they got gold up to 25% of their total reserves. So over $150 billion of the $600 billion in gold. But here's the, here's the beauty of gold. It just looks, it's not just that it looks pretty. It's physical and it's secure in vaults in Russia. So you can't seize it or freeze it the way you can with U.S. Treasury securities. So now you'll have all these payments going back and forth. The U.S. can interdict it. U.S. sanctions don't mean anything. And by the way, I told, I met in the Pentagon with uh, uh, you know, uh, military officials, but also Treasury officials and Federal Reserve officials 10 years ago. And I told them this was happening. I said, your sanctions are very powerful. They are, but they're overusing them. 
And the question is, how many times can you hit the punching bag before the punching bag gets up and walks out of the room? And now we're at that point. We've overused the sanctions. We've targeted countries that don't deserve it. We put on secondary sanctions. So the the room, uh, sorry, the, the punching bag, meaning the bricks, basically, uh, are are walking out of the room, starting their own their own currency. So is it the end of the dollar overnight? No, but it's the beginning of a trend. Uh, and more importantly, this is one explanation why the price of gold, yep. dollar price of gold, has been hitting hitting all time highs every day. 